everybody. Uh, I'm Paul Gavriluk. I uh, teach at the theology department of the University of St. Thomas, and I'm also uh, the organizer of uh, our department's series, uh, New Frontiers in Theological Research. And it is my great pleasure uh, to present my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. John Martins, uh, who will be uh, speaking to us today on the subject of children in the early uh, Christianity and also in the history of Christianity. Uh, professor Martins is a professor of uh, uh, Philo studies, uh, New Testament, and early Christian studies at uh, uh, our department, at theology department in the University of St. Thomas. Um, um, he uh, studied at St. Michael's College uh, of the University of Toronto and received his doctorate uh, in Christianity and Hellenistic Judaism from McMaster University in 1991. Um, from 1989 to 1990, he was visiting student at the University of Tübingen and also conducted research and attended seminars at the Institut Judaicum in Germany. Um, he also tells me that uh, he studied uh, biblical Hebrew, uh, rabbinical Judaism, and biblical archaeology at the University of Haifa. Uh, he um, is a, a columnist at the um, um, America Journal, uh, the National Catholic Weekly, uh, and he's been a columnist since November 2012. And he also now has uh, a blog on scripture, both for the online edition of America Journal uh, and also for his own blog uh, entitled uh, very formally, BibleJunkies.com. Uh, um, and uh, that particular blog has followers all around the world, uh, that number actually in tens of thousands, uh, including about 5,000 uh, followers from Ukraine. It just showed me, actually. So there's a, there's a, there's a, I have hard evidence uh, for that. Uh, his numerous, uh, Professor Martins' numerous publications include um, a monograph entitled One God, One Law, Philo of Alexandria on the Mosaic and Greco-Roman Law. And this is from Brill in 2003. Uh, and this was a monograph in which he traced the uh, influence of the Greco-Roman understandings of law and the philosophical understandings of law upon Philo's reinterpretation of the Mosaic tradition. He also, in 2003, published my own personal favorite, and that is the book uh, titled The End of the World, and the subtitle is The Apocalyptic Imagination in Film and Television. Now, uh, if you want to know the exact date of the end of the world, you might want to turn elsewhere, but if you want to know, uh, if you want an account, a phenomenal account of a kind of a theology of Hollywood, this is a book to turn to. I just watched uh, Prometheus uh, on the plane, and I can tell you it actually fits the bill of what Professor Martins is arguing in the book. He's arguing that unlike uh, Christian uh, apocalyptic literature, you have a similar set of themes in the uh, sort of gamut of topics on which Hollywood draws, with one tremendous exception. It's an apocalypse in which God is usually absent, and the forces of evil are sort of tightly organized. Uh, and the church usually ends up being corrupt, and believers are not sure quite what they're thinking about. But God is absent, and we are sort of uh, uh, left to fend for ourselves. So uh, Professor Martins tells me also that there is, there's, there's certainly time for a new edition of the book, because so many apocalyptic movies have appeared since 2003. Now, the topic of today's presentation is, as I mentioned, uh, children in the early church. And on the topic of this presentation, Professor Martins recently published a book, Let the Little Children Come to Me, and the subtitle is Childhood and Children in Early Christianity. I should say that this book was co-authored uh, with Professor Cornelia Horn, uh, who formerly also taught uh, at our department. The book was published by Catholic University Press, and there is also a chapter from the book, right? Or is it? A, it's it's a different. It's it's okay. So it's a, um, um, it's a it's a it's an article on on a related topic, um, 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 and a copy of the article you can you, you can pick pick up as you as you leave the room. 
Um, uh, so um, uh, I, I should also mention that the brochure uh, for the book uh, is available on the table uh, outside outside the hall. Um, uh, well, without further ado, uh, please welcome Professor John Martins. Thank you for coming. I appreciate it. Um, I think I can promise more fun than the Monday night football game at any rate. Um, for those of you who are interested in those sorts of things. Um, I want to start with a question. What was life like for a child in the ancient world? And I have up here some questions about what do I mean by ancient world, and academics enjoy definitions, and I'm no different. So I want to set the parameters for what I want to discuss here, and I'm really looking at the world from about the 4th century BCE to around the 4th century CE. And this will let us look at life prior to the rise of Christianity and life following the rise of Christianity. What was a child in the ancient world? You might have heard before that the notion of childhood was a construct of modernity. Philip Aries was most responsible uh, for this notion. That's not true. I just want to say that directly. Um, there are major differences in the way that we understand children today in childhood. And one of the major ones when you look at the ancient world is that childhood just goes on and on nowadays. Uh, it seems not really to ever end. I hear people on television talk about athletes who are 25 as being the kid. Um, when you were 25 in the ancient world, you were not the kid. Uh, languages such as Hebrew, Greek, and Latin all have words to define childhood and the stages of childhood. For instance, you can find in Greek words to define three, four, five words to define the, your life from infancy until around the age of a young teenager. Brephos, uh, Napios, Pais, Paideon, Merakion, Neoniskos. You can find all kinds of stages of childhood. They certainly were aware of what a child was. So, well, let me just move on. I wanted just to show you a couple of images um, just to put before us actual children. Uh, this was sent to me by a colleague um, from University of Freiburg in Switzerland, Veronique Dassen, uh, and they appear in her article, Wax and Plaster Memories, in a um, collection of articles called Roman Family Five. This is a funerary mask of around a four-year-old child from about the year 160. Uh, it, it's quite remarkable. We get a lot of information from funerary uh, inscriptions about the age of children when they died, how long, obviously, um, they were married, if they were married. And this tells us, for instance, when people always wonder, I mean, is the information that we get from text correct? Like, were children really being married at the ages of 13 or 14, things like that, for girls? In fact, from the inscriptional evidence, we learn that, in fact, this is the case in many instances, that this is when people did marry. This is not in as good a condition. This funerary mask is of about an 11 to 12-year-old girl, um, again around the year 160. So I just wanted to put before us these actual faces of children as we move on. And the first thing to deal with, of course, is one of the starkest realities of the ancient world, regardless of what people or culture you're dealing with, was child mortality. The rate of death of children, specifically infants, was extremely high, as was maternal mortality in childbirth, something we often forget. So I have up here two pieces of data, one from the excellent historian uh, Peter Garnsey and another from the excellent historian Mark Golden. Um, Garnsey uh, suggesting 28% of children born live or 280 out of 1,000 died in the course of the first year. Mark Golden says the number is probably closer to 30 to 40%. This reality crossed all class, ethnic, and gender boundaries. It shaped the view of childhood itself as, and the child as something that was extremely vulnerable. 
there was a stark difference between Jews and Greco-Roman pagans in one respect. So I'm talking about circumstances prior to the rise of Christianity, and that's how did they treat the children who did survive? All of the surviving evidence points to pagan practices of exposure of children and infanticide in some cases. The same evidence is unanimous in telling us that the Jews did not engage in these practices. The Roman historian Tacitus, in a very famous passage, remarks on the oddity of the Jews in that they raised every children born to them. So it's sort of like a head shaker for him. Why do they do this? In the Roman Empire, a child entered the family through ritual, not by virtue of birth. Whether a child was accepted into the family was dependent upon the father and his patria potestis, or his power or authority. Now, Eleanor Scott has argued in a number of articles that we ought not to think, because the general view used to be, well, girls were often exposed or, or killed more than boys. She says the data does not back this up and that when children were exposed, it was more often linked to economics, superstition, the health of the child, and very often the suspect parentage. If there was a concern that the child was not the father's, for instance, he might indeed uh, expose the child. What was life like for those children who managed to survive the first year of life? It depended on a number of factors. Were you born free or a slave? We often forget this fact of the ancient world that 30 to 40% of children were born as slaves. Were you rich or poor? If you were poor as were most children, your working life might begin at the age of six or seven, working in the fields or as an apprentice. If your family was wealthy, you would be served and cared for by slaves and even accompanied to school by slaves, the most famous uh, probably uh, example of, a, of such a slave would be the pedagogos because it appears in the New Testament on a couple of occasions, this term. And this was a slave who was responsible for a wealthier boy usually. There were domestic slaves who took care of wealthier girls. But the pedagogos, part of his task was to get the boy to school without getting into trouble, make sure he got to school. But there was actually a serious matter to this apart from skipping school, and that was and a number of, um, of ancient commentators mention it, and that was to keep them free from pederasts. And unfortunately, this will play uh, a part in what I'll talk about later. Were you a boy or a girl? Small percentage of boys would receive an education. The vast majority would not. That is a formal education. Most boys would be apprenticed to learn a trade or work. If you came from a wealthy family, then you could expect not just your elementary education, but a secondary education. And then you might enter the military or politics, or something like that. Almost no girls received a formal education. And there are examples, of course, of girls receiving an education both in Judaism and in the Greco-Roman world. But they are those sorts of examples that sort of prove the point this was not a regular occurrence. But keep in mind, the number of boys being educated formally was also very small at this point. Most girls were trained in the domestic arts. All the evidence suggests that regardless of wealth or status, girls were trained in spinning wool to make clothes. This was one thing that bound them together. Many girls were also apprenticed to learn trades. The early life of children was similar for Judaism and the Greco-Roman world, especially in terms of apprenticeship, work, and education. It is possible, though, that more Jewish boys learned how to read through education at the synagogue. Now, th this is a difficult issue, though, because there's disagreements over when the synagogue started, the function of the synagogue, and things like that. Um, but it seems likely, because there was reading within the synagogue, that it, there were at least um, some boys learning how to read there. As to religious life, children were included in religious life in both Judaism and paganism. Um, there was no real entry requirement for girls, girls in Judaism, although we know of the uh, rite of circumcision at eight days for boys. Pagan children were often involved in family worship, which was centered on the hearth and the domestic gods and goddesses. In fact, these religious, religious rituals drew mothers and daughters together in particular 
as the domain of women was the home. So they had a major role to play in these religious rites. But it was also an opportunity for fathers and young sons to spend time together. Because in the Greco-Roman world, most fathers did not play a role in their child's upbringing uh, until they reached probably the age of seven. Uh, up until that point, it was mothers and perhaps servants or slaves. In terms of sex and marriage, Jews and Greco-Roman pagans shared some common practices and a number of differences. Girls would marry at puberty or slightly older in Judaism, boys at around 18 years of age. And obviously, I'm just making generalizations. You can find uh, differences in practice as well. Sexuality outside of marriage in Judaism was prohibited, especially same-sex relationships, which of course doesn't mean they didn't happen. Now, that's a different issue, but this is about social or cultural uh, expectations. In the Greco-Roman world, girls would marry at puberty or slightly older, sometimes um, you know, into late teens as well. So I, I don't want to suggest that every girl was getting married at 12 or 13, but there's lots of evidence for that too. And there's even evidence, unfortunately, for prepubescent marriage. Sex outside of marriage in the Greco-Roman world was licit for males as long as certain conditions were met. It wasn't really dependent on age, nor was it dependent upon particular views of morality. Sexual partners in the Greco-Roman world were licit basically on the basis of what was your relationship to that person? Did you have authority with respect to them? Did they have authority with respect to you? Many boys were sexual partners of older men, a practice known as pederasty. And it's going to be something I spend a little bit of time talking about when we talk about what difference Christianity might have made. Now, this was a practice that if conditions socially were met, there was no condemnation morally or in terms of, well, this is a male-male relationship. And you can find a number of treatises from the ancient world arguing for the superiority of this sort of sexual love to that of a married couple, for instance. Um, a couple of books that are well worth reading on this score in the Greco-Roman world are Christian Lay's book, L-A-E-S, Outsiders Within, Children in the Roman Empire, and Craig Williams' Roman Homosexuality. For Greco-Roman girls, sexual behavior was dependent upon whether they were free or slave. Free girls were to maintain their virginity until marriage, and they got a lot of help from their parents. Uh, that is, the home was where they were to remain. And remember, marriage is taking place at a fairly early age, and so children were guarded uh, fairly closely, that is, girls, until that point. And even boys were, right, via the pedagogos, even though they spent more of their time outside of the home. Slave girls and slave boys, however, had no choice in their sexual partners, at least um, if this was being imposed upon them, as it could be. So to ask what life was like for a child requires determining whether a child was born as a slave or a free person, rich or poor, boy or girl, Jewish or pagan. And I think that's fair to say about our world in a, in a number of different ways, not with respect to slavery necessarily, um, although there still is, unfortunately, much human trafficking in the world, just not accepted legally. It's fair to generalize and say that childhood ended earlier in the ancient world than today. The transition to adulthood for girls was especially rapid because it took place at marriage. And I'll give an example of that <clears throat> as we move forward. So how did Christianity impact the basic understanding of childhood and the lives of children? In terms of day-to-day -day life, Christianity followed the model of Judaism in the Greco-Roman world in areas such as work, education, and even marriage. And realistically, there wasn't much Christianity could do, even centuries after Christianity. I mean, children had to work if they needed to work. I mean, we, they did not live in a world in which you could simply... Uh, allow your child to play whatever the ancient version of video <laughs> games might be. Uh, sometimes you needed to work to eat, and that's what had to be done. With respect to morality, Christianity followed Judaism, outlawing exposure, infanticide, and abortion. The same things Christians would say about these practices had already been said by the Jews, in some cases centuries earlier. 
Uh, this needs to be said because in so many ways, the morality of Christianity was really based upon the Jewish model. In some cases, even adopting the same language. Christians all also follow Judaism in terms of sexual morality. In this case, Christians, as I hope to show, not just followed Jewish critiques, but also created a new understanding of what we can call sexual abuse of the child, based not on Leviticus 18.22 or Leviticus 20.13, which are rarely if ever cited by the Christians, but upon the treatment of these boys as slaves and the need to reject such practices. So I'm going to argue that there are two areas in which children's lives were especially impacted by Christian teaching and practice. One was the high assessment of children as models of the religious life based upon Jesus' teaching. And the second is that Christianity was able to critique Greco-Roman sexual practices with respect to children more forcefully because Christianity grew larger and was wider spread throughout the Roman Empire than Judaism. That is, they had more sway ultimately as Christianity grew, and they would even create, as I will argue, a new language to suggest that. So I begin then with point one, Jesus' teachings about children. And hopefully you all were able to pick up a handout with the, uh, the passages um, from the Gospels on uh, Jesus' teaching. The reception of children into the Christian community and the understanding of children as model disciples is attributed to Jesus. In a number of sayings found in the Synoptic Gospels, Jesus welcomed children into the group of his followers or held them up as examples for all his disciples and as models of the kingdom of God. No other group does Jesus hold up as a model for imitation for his disciples. And I've been going over this in my head over the last few days trying to de determine, is this true? Um, I can find examples of, obviously, the Samaritan or the widow uh, or Zacchaeus or individuals who become models for Jesus' teaching, but I can't think of another group who Jesus holds up as a model for imitation of the Christian life. I'm, I'm willing to be corrected, but let, let's have some bold statements at least, right? Uh, and then have them disproven. We should determine something in advance. Did Jesus actually say these things about children? Biblical scholars like to ask these sorts of questions. Historical Jesus research judges historicity on the basis of certain criteria or indices to historicity. The fact that such indices or to historicity are met doesn't mean necessarily that the passages are historical, but I really think it pushes the preponderance of evidence in that direction. I think Jesus' sayings on children meet four of the criteria. One is coherence. And by that I mean that Jesus' focus on children does cohere with his concern for the lowly, the outcast, the marginalized, and the weak. I think we can say it meets the criterion of discontinuity. Neither the later church nor Judaism spoke this way about children as models for the religious life. And you can argue that, and I will, that the church has had a hard time figuring out what to do with these sayings, uh, often simply not paying attention to them. Uh, embarrassment. This is an interesting criterion. John Meyer, a scholar at Notre Dame, uses this. I'm not sure if embarrassment's the right word. I couldn't think of a better one. It's a strong word and maybe imperfect, but what it means is, why would you create this kind of saying and attribute it to Jesus when you have so much trouble putting it into practice? I think it goes back to Jesus. Multiple attestation, it's in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. I think with four of these criteria met, uh, I'm convinced that the teachings go back to Jesus himself. So we at least have to look at that material, uh, and then we can actually look at what was said. I'm not going to read these passages because you have them in front of you. I'm going to try to save a little bit of time um, by talking about how I see the passages which appear, as I said, in all three Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Matthew, and Luke, and there's two sets of sayings. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, it's hard not to read them in some ways, but since you do have them in front of you, I'll just um, show you the Matthean passage as well. The real focus here is on welcoming a child, and whoever welcomes a child, as it says in verse 5, welcomes me. In verse 6, an important verse as well, it also appears in Mark, if any of you put a stumbling block before any before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were fastened around your neck and you were drowned in the depth of the sea. Now, interpretation can take you in a lot of different directions, but that seems pretty clear. Whoever gives a, even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. And then this also from Matthew, take care that you do not despise one of these little ones, for I tell you, in heaven their angels continually see the face of my Father in heaven. In the sh shortest version of this teaching actually appears in Luke. Um, but we still have the basic, welcome the child, you welcome me. <clears throat> and then the millstone passage appears elsewhere uh, in the Gospel of Luke. So I've made this argument uh, in the book, Let the Little Children Come to Me, which, as uh, Professor Gaberlich says, was co-written with Cornelia Horn. And in the book, we argued that you can put together the basic outline of Jesus' teaching on children. And it has these four aspects. If you welcome a child in my name, you welcome me. Whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, it would be better to be thrown into the sea with a millstone. See that you do not despise one of these little ones, for their angels always behold the face of my Father. Whoever gives a cup of water to one of these little ones, he will not lose his reward. Welcome this little child. The word is paideon, the diminutive of the Greek pais. Little ones originally applied to children. And again, if you have questions about that, we can discuss it. Uh, because the term becomes more broadly applied to all of Jesus' disciples at various points. I think it originally applies to children. The Greek form is mikros or mikroi, little ones. Uh, and the Hebrew is some form of katan, which they use in the rabbinic literature, a small one or a little one in the same way. I think the teaching has a basic parallelism, which is based on a larger structure. Welcome the child. If you do not welcome the child, you will be punished. Do not despise the child. If you do not despise the child, you will get a reward. This is my argument, is the basic outline of the teaching of Jesus on the reception of children, as far as we can reconstruct it from the three Gospels. And it concerned the concrete reception of children into the Christian community as children. That is, they were welcome as they were, and they were to be protected from all who would prey on them. This is not to say that Matthew's claim that all who desire to enter the kingdom should become like children or become humble like a child is some sort of improper extension of Jesus' teaching. Only, it shouldn't draw us away from Jesus' initial statement that children as children are welcome as a preeminent representatives of Jesus. There is something about children and their place in the kingdom which I don't think is reducible even to one aspect of childhood. And those who have children, who have raised children, and spent time with children know that being a child is not simply reducible to innocence, or if you can remember your own childhood. Um, but there's aspects of that, of the openness of children, of vulnerability, of humility, of lowliness, lack of prestige, simplicity, purity, nearness to God openness to Christ, or any other one attribute. It's all of this and more. There's something about children that makes them models. That's Now, the second body of literature <clears throat> that Jesus talks about is bringing children to Jesus. So this is the second group. It has less um, material... Uh, than we saw with welcoming the child. And this is when the disciples are indignant about people bringing children to Jesus, which of course does indicate that someone 
around Jesus. Maybe just people from the crowd uh, are bringing children to him, but there are children present. And, you know, it's an interesting point. Uh, someone in the, on the SBL steering committee for Child in the Bible <clears throat> noted that it's possible that children in the ancient world might even have been the majority. Now, it's sort of strange given the, you know, the high infant mortality rate, but on the other hand, there's a high death rate for others as well. And it's remarkable, but you might have more children lurking in Jesus' ministry than we might think or around it. There might be a lot of children. Um, Let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for it's to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly, I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms, laid his hands on them, and blessed them. Uh, This is a very similar... You can see that, but I can't any longer on my screen. Uh, Now I can. Good. Um, The joys of technology. I I think they outweigh the the woes, but... um, (laughs) Okay, so this is a Luke passage, uh, very similar, and the Matthean passage. Um, Again... I include 18.3 in here. In the case of both Mark and Matthew, people are bringing children to Jesus in order that he would touch them or lay his hands on them. Some kind of blessing is clearly meant here. Some kind of religious blessing of laying on of hands. Luke has a people bringing even infants to Jesus in order that he touch them. And so my reconstruction is a little bit easier here, I would say. If you look at the verses, you can see they're basically in order here, unlike the other body of literature. So people are bringing children to Jesus. The disciples rebuked them. Jesus said, let the little children come to me. Do not stop them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Whoever does not receive the kingdom of God, like a child will not enter it. He laid his hands on the children and blessed them. It seems that in Jesus' initial teaching, children as children become the model for other disciples. Adults had to imitate not simply their humility, vulnerability, or weakness. Rather, children themselves as actual members of the community were the models for how the community had to receive God and the kingdom. One cannot limit the expected understanding only to one or another aspect of childhood. Children themselves model the way in which one accepts Jesus and the kingdom. I'm going to skip over a few things here. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about time. You're not, though. (laughs) But did the early church see children as models of religious discipleship? Did they welcome children into the church? In terms of basic everyday life, that is, for Christians, after the rise of Christianity, many things remained the same. Children worked at a young age. Most children were not educated. Education for Christian children took place in a regular school environment. This is surprising to people. There aren't Christian schools. There's not the Catholic school down on the corner for quite a long period of time uh, in the early church. Children would simply go to pagan schools to be educated um, for quite a period. It's normal. It's it's natural uh, that these would not necessarily be the things that money would be spent on or that they'd have the ability to do. Children would, however, have received some catechetical education at the church, though we don't know the extent of it or when it began to be formalized in a school setting. Some children had minor offices in the church, such as lectors, which meant someone had to be able to read, singing in choirs, and special assignments in prayer. Children were also baptized as infants very early on. Now, in in the book, Cornelia and I make the argument for that, and it's been an ongoing argument in many ways, but I think it's pretty clear that infants were baptized and at a very young age participated in communion. Uh, You even have infant communion in some areas of the church, in the early church. In most ways, though, I think the church had a difficult time placing children as a model for Christian behavior. They're not easy to enact. And they're difficult to interpret and apply. And the reality is you have to raise children. And 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 it's unclear as to what precisely 
the model should be. And I think in some ways, these teachings are just sort of put to the side. Still, there are some ways in which, um, in which the church did change the lives of children in practical ways for the better. And I do want to concentrate that on that at the end of the presentation. At this point, I want to note the ways in which things didn't necessarily change for better or for worse all the time, or at least not initially. Many slaves were children who worked in better or worse situations depending on their situation and master and, and the type of master they had. Kyle Harper, if you don't know this book or haven't read this book yet, it's, it's just superb, has demonstrated that Christians continued to hold slaves, including children, throughout the period of antiquity and late antiquity. Let me give one example from the martyrdom of Polycarp. It's a well-known story. The martyrdom of Polycarp reports that when a persecution broke out in ancient Smyrna, modern Izmir, Polycarp was spirited away to a hiding place in the country against his own wishes. He didn't want to. Since the pursuers could not find him, they took from his house two of his slave boys, Pydaria, and tortured them. Now, this was just a common Roman practice. That's how you got confessions out of slaves. You just tortured them. That was a Roman practice because you couldn't trust a slave. One of the slave boys confessed, and so the officials took that boy, Pydarian, and had him lead them to Polycarp's hiding place. It's not clear if these boys are Christians like Polycarp, because torture was the common method Romans employed to gain information from slaves. That is, they, they would have done that whether the slaves were Christians or not. This is a well-known account of a famous bishop's martyrdom, and hiding in plain sight are his slave boys. And I want to make it clear that this says nothing about Polycarp himself. The fact, you know, that he abused them or treated the slaves poorly, but that the expectation is that slaves were present. And we'll find that in later Christianity as well. They remain present in the life of uh, Christian families. Another area of life which didn't change much with Christianity was the age at which girls were married. Girls were married at puberty or just beyond, as I mentioned. In a pagan context, when that goal was reached, dolls together with other toys were brought to the shrine of a female goddess. There's a famous example that we talk about in our book, Timorete. It's often referred to because she dedicated her timpana, a ball, a hairband, her dolls, to the goddess Artemis, and then went to get married. A different world. <laughs> Uh, girls made the transition to adulthood rapidly, and giving up dolls for marriage only represents the sharpest of these transitions. As far as we can tell, the reason I mention this is there was no shift in the age at which girls were married when they became Christians or when Christianity began to arise. You still had basically the same age of marriage. Um, and, and again, I, I want to make it clear that you know, not every girl was married right at puberty, but it, it was a point when marriage was sought uh, and betrothals could have taken place when the child was eight years old, nine years old, something like that, preparing for the time when they would get married. David Balsh and Carolyn Osiak note that Christian girls still married at the same ages as pagan girls to men who are generally much older. What does change in I'm not going to explore this in any depth, unfortunately, tonight, is the option that Christianity offered for girls not to marry. And this goes back to Paul's letter to the Corinthians, especially 1 Corinthians 7. The option of consecrated virginity might have been a far more positive option than we might consider today. Uh, that is, it, it might have been a difficult choice for a young girl to marry a much older man. And the option and the opportunity to study, which girls were offered uh, in a consecrated atmosphere and environment, might have been seen as a very positive one. One major change in the lives of Christian slaves or slaves who belong to Christians, slightly different thing, that would impact young slaves especially was the church blessings or growing sacramentalizing of their marriages. 
Romans did not admit slave marriages as legal institutions. And the relationship of mother, father, son or daughter was not accepted or not seen, even if that is two slaves had children together. The mother could be sold, the father could be sold, any of the children could be sold. They simply didn't recognize those relationships. Roman law did not conceptualize a phenomenon like adultery with a slave woman. Although a slave's owner could sue for injury to his or her property if she was improperly uh, used sexually. But it was to the owner that repair was made, not to the woman. Christian teaching on the marriage of slaves allowed slave children a semblance of normal family life, but it's not certain that this meant that child slaves were never sold or that their parents were never separated from their children by sale or work in some other holding of their own or another master. That is, they might still have been separated from their actual family. That these realities continued to vex the lives of young and old slaves into the third and fourth centuries is apparent even from Christian witnesses. So Basil of Caesarea knew of slave girls who were joined in secret marriages and who, as he thought, by this brought impurity on their owners' houses. Why they married in secret cannot be determined from his offhand comments about this. One reason may have been, though, that they could not obtain a proper Christian wedding. Perhaps they simply wished to live a normal life that was denied them when their masters ignored their desire for marriage. If the secret marriage of slaves was designed so that they would not live in promiscuity, it would be difficult to see why Basil considered such relationships between slaves as a threat to the purity of their owner's house. Because Basil was aware that masters could force their slave girls into unwanted sexual relations. And he mentions it. And he's talking about Christian masters here. And he did not hold such girls morally culpable. Would not a secret marriage be less impure than a master abusing a slave girl? So we don't have all the evidence here about what these secret marriages were like, but it's a, it points to the fact that Christian slaves at this time were trying to construct for themselves an actual family life. And now I want to turn to those areas in which I think we can definitively say that Christian belief and behavior turned the tide for children in a number of areas. I've mentioned some of these already in the context of Jewish beliefs, and my final point, my point too from much earlier on in this talk, will examine the Christian response to pederasty in which Christians brought new arguments and concerns. Exposure, Christians did not expose children. Now, the interesting thing about exposure is, and this was something when I began this research I wasn't aware of, it really didn't often lead to death because people, that is slave traders and pimps, knew where the children were put. And so they would go and take the children. And so when you read Christian authors like Clement and others, their criticism is often that, for instance, look at Pedagogus 3.3. He considered the possibility that a man um, when, who had exposed a child might be brought up for a life of prostitution, and that man might subsequently have intercourse in a brothel with the very child that he had abandoned. It's an odd argument, but Justin Martyr makes it too. So it must have been common enough that children were abandoned and then taken into brothels and that people who frequented those brothels might have had sex with their own offspring when using a prostitute. Justin compared bringing up these children to raising herds of animals. Christians did not practice infanticide or abortion following the Jews in this respect. <clears throat> and the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas, which I'll talk about again, two early Christian documents, either from the late 1st or early 2nd centuries, um, talk about not killing a child by miscarriage and then talk about infanticide, neither shall you kill a child. It's entirely possible that one of these texts borrowed the passages from the other because they're very similar in this respect. A number of scholars have worked on these connections between them. But I want to suggest that there also might be a new set of commandments that the Christians are circulating to deal with new circumstances in the Greco-Roman world for new converts and catechists and which took into account these now common practices when the Christian movement moved out of Palestine 
into the broader world. The listing of these prohibitions, especially in a form strongly reminiscent of the Ten Commandments, suggests that they might have circulated or been recited orally in the early church. Or even that they might have a Jewish prehistory. That is possible. Now, this is the most complicated issue to discuss because it's so wrapped up with current issues, um, such as homosexuality and same-sex marriage and scandals of sexual abuse by priests and subsequent cover-ups by church hierarchs. But any questions you have, we can talk about. Um, what are some of the differences between the ancient world with respect to sexuality in general? The ancient Greco-Roman world did not speak of sexuality as personal identity. Therefore, there was no language for homosexuality or heterosexuality. Keep in mind, for instance, that the word homosexuality is a 19th century neologism unknown to the ancients. They simply didn't use that kind of language. So that makes it difficult because even a book like Craig Williams' Roman Homosexuality basically begins the book by saying, well, the title of the book is a little bit incorrect. Um, nevertheless, um, sexual relations in the Greco-Roman world between males was most often imposed on someone younger or socially inferior, that is, by a freeborn man with a slave or a boy in a socially inferior position. Sex in general was not about mutuality or care for one another, but something that one in a superior position could do to someone in an inferior position, regardless of whether they were male or female. And age was not a general consideration unless, as you read in a number of Christian Lay's works on pederasty, that there was an age beyond which the boys were considered too old, that they were no longer desirable, now, these are broad generalizations. I'm not suggesting that there were no relationships of mutuality, no relationships of love in the ancient world, that people didn't care about each other, but these are the broad categories in which we have to look at uh, this. My old colleague at the University of Winnipeg, Mark Golden, in his article, Slavery and Homosexuality at Athens, said homosexual relationships did not involve equals. And again, he's working with Language, of course, from the 19th century, but talking about practices that mark the ancient world. This relationship was based on age with the younger partner thought of as subordinate to the older. So while free boys would grow to be men and outgrow the subordinate role in homosexual relationships, slaves never would. And it was often slaves with whom owners had sexual relations and who were sold to others for profit. Now, scholars have debated, actually, whether Mark 9.42 speaks of pederasty in particular. That's, do not create a stumbling block. I don't think that case is proven, um, but it, it has been argued. Um, some people have argued maybe 1 Corinthians 6.9 or 1 Timothy 1.10 speak about this, but it's pretty vague, I think. I don't know that you can make a real argument from any of these passages. I do think, however, that later Christian is anything but vague. Now, I do want to mention, too, that one rarely hears of criticism of the sexual abuse of girls. You do hear about it, but generally pederasty had to do with uh, boys or young men. In my own reading of the Christian text, I've determined a number of criteria upon which Christian authors condemn pederasty. And so I've given you... a. An in, I think an interesting list, I, I, I created the list, but not the actual content, um, and the authors to whom it's attributed. So Tatian, for instance, says, barbarians don't do this, and the Germans in particular. <laughs> um, very critical of slavery or the selling of children, and I think, I think we'd all agree. Clement says they destroy the beauty of these boys. Boys, Clement and Justin say, are not sexual objects, but we should treat them like sons. You've just heard that argument from before. Children in prostitution could be one's own child. And Clement says they feminize boys. Now, this is an argument Philo of Alexandria also made. It's possible that Clement is basing his argument on that. But I want, what I want you to pay attention to is that in all of those condemnations, no Christian writer cites the law of God or the loss of purity or holiness as a reason to reject such practices. 
which indicates to me that these criticisms are attempts to convince those outside of the church that such behaviors are to be rejected. Right? They're not saying this is part of the commandment list or anything like that. Some of these same arguments are found in the pagan author Musonius Rufus. He also says it feminizes boys um, and you ought not to sell children. Philo makes the same arguments. But for most of you, this is probably a word you've not heard of before, pedophithorio. And this is a word which emerges in the late first or early second century CE and continued in Greek Christian literature into late antiquity. And it presents a much more complex story. Pederasty is create, created from the words child, pace, and erao, erotic uh, or sexual love. And it was either a morally neutral or a positive term. And pedophithorio is a negative term. As a compound word, it has a range of meanings, mostly sexual, including to sexually destroy, ruin, corrupt, or seduce a child. I've translated it as sexual abuse of children. I've gone back and forth as to whether it should be translated as sexual abuse of children or sexual abuse of boys, because it was a term that was particularly focused on being a counterpoint to pederasty. Um, if you are interested, the article that was put out is the argument is the article in which I make the argument uh, that this is uh, how we ought to translate this word. I translate it as sexual abuse of children since it replaces pederasty as a morally positive or neutral term. I also believe it is a Christian word. Now, it's a more complex argument because it appears in a, a Jewish document, Testament of Levi. But that's a heavily Christianized document, uh, and so I think the word uh, is a Christian creation. Now, if it's not, that's all right. Uh, the Jews were on the case a couple of centuries earlier. Uh, but the reason I think it's Christian partly is because that we don't see it really until Didache, Epistle of Barnabas, and then it takes off in a Christian setting, whereas it never gained traction in a Jewish setting. And Testament of Levi is heavily Christianized. Now, the criteria upon which Christian authors condemn sexual practices when they use the word pedophithorio is different than when they use the word pederasty. The law of God is broken. And look at all the authors who make this argument. It's a part of general sexual sins, generally moikeia, adultery, and porneia, a difficult word uh, to translate, sometimes fornication. It represents the illicit behavior of foreign gods, the illicit behavior of the nations, the illicit behavior of other Christians. Yes, they were already throwing this sort of mud at each other <laughs> in the ancient world. Um, it's against nature. And it's against virtue. When we see this word appear, the word pedophithorio, it's in the context of expanded Ten Commandment lists. The first two uses of the verb pedophithorio come in the Didache and the Epistle of Barnabas, and in both cases it appears in a list of prohibitions which borrow from an add to the biblical Ten Commandments. I count 22 commandments in the Didache and 43 in the Epistle of Barnabas. Uh, your calculations might be somewhat different. But it's always placing this condemnation in the context of commandments, and very often between adultery and fornication. And so it, it's, a, it's a simple prohibition. U pedo do not sexually abuse boys, or do not sexually abuse children. And in the Epistle of Barnabas, it has the same prohibition. And then in Epistle of Barnabas 10.6, it ex even explains it in the context of the Mosaic dietary laws, in which the prohibition against eating rabbit is explained as a metaphor indicating the prohibition of the seduction of children. Now, that seems really odd until you realize, and I didn't realize this until some Roman classical scholars told me, if you see sculptures of boys holding a rabbit, that was often a pet of a pederast. And the rabbit is the clue. So the Epistle of Barnabas probably is aware of that. I, I was sort of 
sort of joking about this and they said, oh, actually there's a reason. Uh, there's a reason for interpreting the rabbit in this way. <clears throat> Two pseudo-Athanasian texts from the fourth century CE have the same kind of commandment lists. And you're instructed not to murder, commit adultery, steal, use abortifacients, or abuse boys sexually, among other prohibitions. We also find it in the 318 Nicene Fathers, we should not sexually abuse boys. And that's put in the context of the great commandment attributed to our God and our Lord Jesus Christ. So even if this doesn't appear directly in scripture, they want to make certain that you get the point. This is something you cannot do. Um, Ephraim Gracus uses another list style in which he, in which people, probably monks, are being asked to renounce the works of Satan and then ask, what are these works? Listen, the first two listed in both cases are once again Moikea and Pornea, followed by many other works of Satan and a series of renunciations, including I renounce the sexual abuse of children. And then woes, woe to those who engage in superstition, practice magic, prophesy, sexually abuse boys. I'm not sure how prophecy gets in there, but um, there's actually only a little bit of overlap between the reasons offered for condemning pederasty and for the condemnation of pedophithorio. It seems as if the language used to condemn pederasty using the word pederasty was for those outside, whereas pedophithorio was for Christians inside, which is why the focus on the commandments. Was this a real issue for Christians? Gregory of Nazianzus writes that serving boys stand nearby when he's describing the life of the Christian rich. Some of them in an orderly row with flowing hair and effeminate appearance. Their locks fashionably, fashionably cropped around their faces, groomed far better than they should be for the sake of hungry eyes. There's no mistaking the purpose of these slave boys in this new Christian context. In fact, if you go back and read Philo's condemnations, for instance, he makes these same claims. Um, and there's an excellent article, and I forget, um, I forget the name of the author, I apologize. But he shows that there's a number of sculptures with, that people were not sure of what to make sense of because the hair was very feminine, but the facial features weren't. And he showed that, in fact, the way the hair is cropped is the way that it's described in many... Um, in many ancient texts describing uh, serving boys uh, at symposia and elsewhere. So pedophithorio is particularly applied to Christians or used to define the boundaries of who's included in our community. That is already in the second and third centuries, Christians defined the nature of sexual abuse and spoke against it when it was an otherwise accepted um, societal convention. The problem was significant enough for Christians that the Council of Elvira was the first Episcopal gathering that actually dealt with this in a canon. And I have to thank uh, both Mike Hollerick and Mark Del Colliano for helping me translate this canon. Um, this took, this council is somewhere around 300 to 309. I don't know that there's an exact date for it yet, <clears throat> but this is the Latin, um, the Latin phrase, and this is, Translation, which again, I'm pretty much dependent on my colleagues for it. I thank you for that. Communion ought not to be given to sexual abusers, not even at the end of their life. Very often at the end of your life, you were allowed to commune. But it seems like this is pretty clearly not the case. I also located a translation uh, in the canon law, through the canon law program at CUA. Those who sexually abuse boys may not commune even when death approaches. So this is pretty clearly defining this practice is unacceptable, and it's in the early fourth century. So we know that this practice was you know, still going on, although the Christians were pretty clear this needed to stop. Some general thoughts to conclude, and thanks for hanging in there with me. Actual children, Jesus taught, are the model disciples and they must be welcomed as Jesus himself and as representatives of God. Children model for us the nature of discipleship and the manner in which the kingdom of God is constituted. Jesus warns us not to harm them, but rather to protect them. While the early church was by no means perfect, 
certainly didn't, for instance, challenge early on the slavery of children or modify the early marriage of girls as examples. This language used to describe sexual abuse of children, in which the church declared in a number of ways was against the Ten Commandments, spoke broadly of the protection of children when they were the only voice heard on this issue. <clears throat> so where are we today? Um, in many ways, life is much better for children all over the world in almost every respect. Life expectancy. Still, the most basic teachings of Jesus regarding children have yet, I would argue, to be truly considered by the church. What does it mean? How are we supposed to do this? One of the things we could start doing is stop protecting the people who harm children. That's not hard. Thank you very much, Professor Martins, for a wonderful lecture. Uh, we now have a good uh, 20 minutes or so for, for questions uh, and uh, comments. Um, please. There's certainly a lot of data here, <laughs> uh, which is why I, I did put most of it up on on PowerPoint, so at least you can follow some of it, but I did throw a lot of material up there. Um, but there might be questions that you have regarding particular aspects um, of, of maybe childhood in general, childhood life that I couldn't get into in much depth or other ways in which the church might have uh, altered the lives of children. <laughs> uh, that uh, uh, infant baptism was uh, uh, regular from, from, from when? Um, we think infant baptism was regular from a fairly early stage. Uh, so the question had to do with at what point did infant baptism become a regular practice of the early church? Part of the reason we think it's the case, and this isn't so much a positive argument from the data uh, or at least not the Christian data itself, is that there really was a lot of involvement of children in the life of religion in Greco-Roman paganism. They played a major role, and we do have the reception of children into Judaism, at least boys, in a formal way uh, at the age of eight days. We think that there was no reason that Christians would not have accepted children uh, at an early stage. Uh, into a new covenantal situation. Um, now, the arguments, as you know, were, uh, took place in the 1960s, especially with Jeremias and I think Bruce Metzger um, arguing whether or not infant baptism is a late, uh, you know. Jeremias take the household. Uh, yes, yeah. Household baptism. Yeah. Uh, the, the point here about household baptism is you, you find in Acts of the Apostles, um, perhaps in some of Paul's letters as well, but you really find the language in the Acts of the Apostles that whole households are being brought in. And that would have included, the argument is, and that's the argument I, I do take as well, that that would have included children. Um, as to whether it would have included slaves, that, that's, that's a difficult one, although that's a possibility as well. Um, Thanks, John. What, what uh, uh, or, or orphans? I mean, a question about orphans, treatment of orphans uh, seems to be a, a protected category in Jewish uh, Old yeah, Testament that... thought in general. What, what do we know about the uh, the treatment of uh, orphans or the uh, Christian pra early Christian practices with respect to orphan children, whether Christians or 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 not or pagan children, yeah. orphans? Um... Thanks. The question is about orphans and the treatment of orphans. Widows and orphans were treated um, well by the Jews, and, and there were religious uh, reasons for doing so. I, the Christians do as well. Later on, certainly many children are brought to monastic settings uh, to be cared for there. 
Um, I mean, this goes on into the Middle Ages where if you go to Rome, you can still find uh, monasteries where they have basically a turntable where the child could be put on and turned in and then no questions asked, the child would be cared for. Uh, in the ancient world, Christians were known for caring for orphans as well. So it became a way of reducing the exposure of children as well. That's a really good point, actually, that um, if you could find a place for a child to be cared for, um, then that, you know, you wouldn't have to expose them either. Now, th there's something interesting about exposure that I didn't mention here because I think I had enough on, on the plate here already. There's a very intriguing ar article in uh, a volume called Roman Family, I think, six. Uh, Beryl Rawson, uh, the late Beryl Rawson from Australia, who basically was one of the major uh, impetuses in childhood studies in, in the Roman world, um, she started this series, and in Roman Family 6, there's an article that argues that there were often children who had been exposed as infants who late, and, and raised as slaves who would later argue for their freeborn status. Now, how could that take place? Well, she said people knew, and who knew often were the slaves and servants, where that child had gone, and they kept track of them. So even with exposure, you still had you know, people who knew who the children were. Uh, really fascinating, actually. Um, but I do think that orphans also uh, gave another option uh, in that you did not have to um, then worry about your child being exposed and raised to a life of slavery. But when that begins, I'm not certain. I'm not certain that the earliest Christians had the ability to do that. I, I'm certain they might have had the desire to. Uh, but I'm not sure when it begins. Um, uh, thanks for the word study, uh, which uh, was quite interesting. Uh, the, I think you established something there about differences of usage and, and the context, what that might tell us uh, um, about um, uh, what, what was of concern yeah. and, and, in, and in what particular setting. Uh, at least one of your citations for Peter Thoreau was from uh, a monastic rule. Yes. Uh, I didn't see which one, um, uh, but am, am, would I be wrong in guessing that this probably was a fairly constant theme because of some yeah. uh, being a particularly hazardous environment, yeah. to be honest. It, yeah, and so the question is, was the monastic setting a hazardous environment for boys and for uh, sexual uh, abuse of boys? And, and it was. Uh, and that's the bottom line. And I didn't bring all of that data in here. Uh, some of that data is going to appear in a forthcoming article called I Renounce the Sexual Abuse of Children. Uh, and that will be in, I think it's Roman Family 7, in which classicists and scholars of Judaism and Christianity got together to compare notes, as it were, in late antiquity. And yeah, it, it, be, it becomes problematic. and And... You know, because Christianity, as much as it transformed Greco-Roman society, was also bringing in a lot of people from that culture, and the practices were practices that were known to them. And until slavery was going to be dealt with, I think the whole notion that people would not be used sexually, you know, with impunity, was something that was going to be a hard sell even for Christians, right? But these were my slaves. And I think you find the same thing, uh, unfortunately, in these monastic settings. Um, and, you know, you even find it in Jewish texts. Uh, the forthcoming article I deal also with Mishnaic and Talmudic texts. Now, it, it's very interesting because in the earlier rabbinic texts, uh, they warn about, for instance, a male teacher being alone with a male student. But then later Talmudic texts commenting on that say, but it's not because we're worried about pederasty. It's because the mother might be single. But it's very clear from these earlier Jewish texts that there is a concern. And, they, and for instance, one of the monastic texts, and I can't remember uh, the name of it, has basically the same warning as a Jewish rabbinic text, and that is two men should not lay on the same mat together if they're unmarried. It's pretty clear what the concern is. And here it's not talking about children as such, or necessarily, but uh, just concerns about sexual behavior. But the rabbinic texts also mention 
you know, be careful about letting your boys go into market too heavily perfumed because they're going to attract too much attention. That was a concern in pagan texts and Christian texts and uh, in Jewish. Someone. You were mentioning um, Jesus and the early times, I think, that the girls will be married to another man. And when this change, and, it, and now it looks like it's not right. If a, if a teenager um, it's going to marry, or, or an older man, it's attractive to a young girl of yeah. that age. Yeah. When did that change and why it's now, it's like the society, how, how did that happen that it's not good now? Or yeah. the majority of people think it's not good. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. The question is, when did this change come uh, where a young teenage girl married to a much older male, maybe twice as old and in many cases, became something that was unacceptable or looked down upon? I should say that in some traditional cultures, it still happens today. I mean, that, that's important to keep in mind. I mean, I think what has to change is a view of women that their only purpose is not to be married and have children, uh, which is why puberty, of course, is that dividing line. But that type of marriage that I talked about, it was less common in Judaism because males got married at a younger age. Now, possibly that's because Jewish males didn't have the same sort of sexual outlets as Greco-Roman males did, right? Uh, the ex only acceptable manner was to be married. But what they call it is the Mediterranean pattern of marriage. Young female, older male. So the male, and, and we can tell how old basically they are. And again, funeral inscriptions come into play here. If you look at a young man who dies at around the age of 20, generally the inscription is sponsored by his parents. But by the time the male hits 26, 27, 28, it's his wife. So you have this pattern of men getting married around 25 and older and girls being married more in pu at puberty. When does this begin to change? That's still the heart of your question, and I think it depends. Um, I mean, realistically, even 50 or 60 years ago, you, you had younger marriages of people getting married in their late teens, for instance, on a regular basis. But about the pattern of the older and younger, I. I'm not sure. I'm not sure I can answer it clearly. I don't know if it's when romantic love becomes the model and not simply the joining of families together because that was the big issue with marriage, right? Uh, especially for upper class people is joining two families together and producing progeny uh, for the family. In fact, Augustus in the Roman Empire introduced laws that you had to be married by 20. Now, this was really for the nobility. Right? That's what he was concerned about, that there was not enough children being born to the nobility. But that did indicate that people were putting it off, especially males. And um, yeah, I, it's very hard to answer because I think, A, you still find it in some cases. And, I, and I'm not exactly sure where the dividing line is. The only argument I suppose you could make for younger ages of marriage is that you know, life expectancy was much shorter. But it doesn't explain exactly the much older male, younger female marriage. I mean, the Jewish marriage of someone who's 14 or 15 with an 18-year-old male uh, makes a little more sense. And there's some data in the Talmud of a 16-year-old male getting married. And it, it was in the context of a dispute uh, between when a student of the Torah, a rabbinic student, should get married. And a number of them were arguing well, you should marry after your studies. Because if you're married, that'll get in the way of your studies. But this one young man is reported to have said, I got married when I was 16 and I poked Satan in the eye. That is, temptation, sexual temptation was gone, and so he had done a good thing uh, by getting married at that young age. So we, we hear about some young male marriages in Judaism. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else has, has thoughts on when that transition in marriage begins to take place, but I think certainly into the medieval period, into early modernity, even into modernity, you still have, have that sort of pattern uh, taking place. I, I think that 
the transition to simply viewing women um, as able and capable uh, in, in many respects beyond simply um, being married and having children is a key issue. Um, and I, I think the move to romantic love as, as a, you know, the, sort of the, the means or, or the reason for marrying and not simply family connections. Because if it's family connections, the earlier the better. And so, in fact, in the Roman Empire, it's upper class girls who get married at a younger age than poorer girls, interestingly. How many times do you think a man might marry a woman who is Mm. I, I don't. I don't. The question is, how many times would a man be married, given that you have high rates of maternal uh, death um, uh, in childbirth? Well, it, it's that's hard to answer. But remember, there is also a lot of widows, because the men were much older, uh, and so yeah, I think it would work both ways. I think you'd, you know, you, you find this in the New Testament: the question of whether younger widows in the pastoral epistles should be enrolled, right, as a widow in the church's uh, role, or whether they should uh, be married again, right? And the, the concern is if they're enrolled as a widow too young, they might want to get married again. But yeah, men did marry more than once. There was no real problem with divorce in the Roman Empire. And I'm not sure when the issue, I know what Jesus teaches about divorce, but in actual practice, I know that John Chrysostom talks about certain Christians who were married like six, seven, eight times, you know? So uh, you, you're right that, you know, the death of spouses uh, would certainly lead to remarriage. Uh, but I think it would cut both ways, both for women who are much younger. So, you know, if you survived, of course, the, the realities of ancient life, uh, including in this case, childbirth, then you could live to a long life. Um, but it was more, it's almost as likely, I would say, that a man would die and a woman would be remarried as well. Uh, uh, in answer to Jane's question, uh, it's worth remembering, too, that at least among some of the more rigorous Christians, uh, marriage after uh, the death of a partner was uh, discouraged. Mm. Um, uh, that was one of the, uh, one of the um, uh, crusading themes of the Montanists, uh, no remarriage after the death of a partner. <laughs> I'm a big voice. <laughs> you spoke quite a bit about um, the uh, pederasty yeah. as, as being um, a sort of wealthy, more powerful man asserting himself over mm -hmm. a, a weaker boy, if I'll yeah. put it that, or a boy in a, a less powerful position, right, basically, right. overall. Um, my question for you is, what about the ladies? Um, what's, what's happening with ladies mm -hmm. uh, in the Greco-Roman world? Are they engaging in something comparable to this uh, uh, scheme of pederasty? And, and if so, uh, are the Christians having to fight against it? Um, you know, you're right that the question is, is there anything equivalent? So you're talking about freeborn women here. No, because adultery was an issue for women. There really is a sexual double standard. So if you were a married woman, Musonius Rufus, for instance, is mocks um, men who sleep with their slaves, male or female, and says, if you think it's such a wonderful thing, maybe you should let your wives sleep with the slaves as well. He thinks, you know, I mean, A, that's, that's just a non-starter. That's ridiculous, and that's his point. So, you know, a freeborn girl was, was to be kept chaste before her marriage. Her virginity was significant if she was freeborn. And likewise, if she was married, and, and again, I'm not saying such things didn't happen, but this was significant because someone would be responsible uh, for adultery uh, if she was to marry someone. But men had this sexual double standard. It was basically built in where they could sleep with people outside of their, outside of their wife. 
So I don't think you do have the equivalent. I mean, there were, you know, if you were a slave, of course, male or female, this was a very difficult position, but there is no real equivalent to pederasty that I know of. Now, th that's not to say that such relationships didn't take place amongst women, right? Uh, and a lot of what we find as, you know, as historians is that a lot of women's culture goes unnoticed and unnoted, which isn't to say it's not going on, right? <laughs> mentioned earlier on that uh, most of the kind of Christian literature on sexual abuse is on the um, male children. Yeah. But there's not much said about female children. So can you speculate on why that is? If, um, yeah. There's, 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 just, there's many possible reasons maybe, but I want to your point of view on it. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good question. And sometimes I think it, it, I haven't paid enough attention to it. I think that might be part of the issue. Um, part of the issue is that it might have been considered just part of a sexual double standard as well. And that because you had no prohibition against, you know, what we would call heterosexual relationships, it, it wasn't considered as problematic. Like a number of the church fathers mentioned, well, people have relations with their uh, slave girls and shouldn't do that. But I don't think there's the same concern as with same-sex relations. Um, and it might be that there's just not the same consideration of females. Uh, but I... I be interested, Mark, to hear if you have any particular thoughts on that. Because, I mean, I, I, I went back and forth on whether to translate pedophithorio as sexual abuse of children or sexual abuse of boys. And, and it was a real question because are they just concerned with boys here? Or are girls in mind as well? I, I just wasn't sure because when they actually talk about who they're concerned about, it tends to be with boys. And I'm not sure either if that has to do with the fact that the only sort of females you'd have access to would be slaves generally or, or prostitutes. And so in, in a sense, they don't count in the same way. I mean, it's amazing when I, when I read John Chrysostom's on vainglory and the right way to raise children, it's focused on how a Christian boy should be raised. It doesn't even talk about a girl except for one paragraph, I think, out of 90. Right. One, it, it's really focused on, on boys, and it's really focused on freeborn, wealthy boys. And slaves are there, but basically the only thing he says about slaves is, your child should learn not to hit the slaves when they frustrate him by breaking his pencil or something. Don't hit them. And don't let him associate with slaves, though, because they have loose morals, uh, and because they will corrupt your child. But they're slave children too, and you know, and they, they simply don't enter into view. So even there, it's just a freeborn boy that's really in mind when they're talking sort of, of the upper classes, as it were. Do you have a question, ma'am? <laughs> I do. Um, Mark has sort of addressed it because I was feeling as well that um, certainly girls would have been sexually abused. And I was wondering what you thought, um, if it was just a case of overlooking them like you would women for a, a long while. In, yeah, yeah. Historically, and someone, some would argue even now. Yeah. And, and then the, uh, but another question I did have, um, because I think that was sort of addressed, is... Is the and it may be a, um, a silly question, but the question of puberty, because mm -hmm. I know that it's roughly the age of what used to be normal now. But as as we progress, you know, puberty hits earlier and earlier, and and so I was beginning to wonder. I mean, it's still they will still have been married earlier than is the norm now. But would it necessarily be 12 or 13? Or could it be more often than not 14, 15? Uh, it may be like a, 
Yeah. You might be splicing hairs, but or no. splitting hairs, but no. I, I mean, I. The, the question is, would puberty? Would there be later onset puberty uh, in the ancient world as compared to now, where I think girls are reaching puberty at a younger age? Um, you know, I, I'm struggling with the for the physician's name. It's an ancient physician. I don't think it's Galen. I think it might be Serranus. Uh, and he actually does talk about puberty and the, and the age of onset of puberty, and it does seem to be around 12 to 14, uh, that the expectation is that a girl will reach puberty. Um, and so, I, I mean, uh, that differed in the ancient world as well, but I still think that's a general age. And, and again, um, it is important. A number of scholars, Keith Hopkins, Brent Shaw, have, point, have tried to look at this carefully and have said, look, not everyone's getting married at 13 or 14. There, there's 16-year-olds, there's 17-year-olds, there's 18-year-olds. You know, and, you know, 18 is, you know, in, but, you know, in the ancient world with uh, lower life expectancy, uh, there's nothing unreasonable about that. And I'm not saying that these girls necessarily found this unreasonable. This is the culture they're living in. But... I just find that transition so shocking whenever I think about these girls going to the goddess and giving up their dolls. And whereas boys had time to develop, right, um, prior to marriage, given some opportunity to develop prior to marriage. Um, and, and, and you do wonder what kind of role that plays out. I'd, you know, because you have a girl who's basically subject either to her husband's patria potestis or his father's patria potestis, because if he's still alive, that father still has control, but she's always going to be under the control, as it were, of a male, which is why consecrated virginity might seem like not such a bad idea, right? Uh, enough with the men telling me in every respect what to do. Now, I, and again, there's a lot of culture that we know goes on for women that men don't know about, right? Uh, positively, uh, but it was very hard, I think, for women in many respects in the ancient world, and it does open up a new area of research. We, we, you know, just these questions about the role of women and the place of women and what did the church have to say about that. I also think the question of when does this change, and I was asked that question, a uh, question came from the back earlier, I was asked that question by Christian Lays as well uh, a year ago at a, in our Rome conference, you know, when does this actually change? I guess I've had a year to answer it. I still haven't um, figured out when exactly that changes. But um, it is really, I, I don't want to give the impression either that everything about the ancient world for children was horrible. I, I don't think it was. But when you think of, you know, every time I think, well, I don't want to exaggerate this reality. You know, I read Roman historians and, you know, the, the, it was a hard world. It was a hard life. <laughs> Augustine says he'd rather die than be young again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, this note, <laughs>